What's up guys, it's Dull Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to Michael Knowles debunks woke TikTok attack. Uh, so, I was recommended this to me. Apparently people really like when I uh, watch the different Knowles videos, they all seem to do well and I always get asked to do more, so uh, this one was specifically was recommended to me by, I actually don't, I can't remember who, but anyway, link to the original video down below, remember to like, comment, subscribe to help the algorithm, and let's get into it. You're about to watch me debunk one of my most popular critics on TikTok. That's right, I'm gonna totally destroy and own him. I will make him my personal property with both facts and logic. We do these kinds of things every <laughs> single day. Ben Shapiro reference. Day in my member block, so do not wait. Click the link in the description below so that you don't miss out. It's like a whole other YouTube channel just for you without the censors. Check it out, hope you enjoy. We got this guy on TikTok. That's what my producers tell me. They've loaded up the TikTok. Let's see if he makes a persuasive argument. So in case of you haven't heard, Peppa Pig has released its first same-sex couple. Unsurprisingly, conservatives are not happy about it. One of them being good old Michael Knowles. First of all, let's take a look at this thumbnail. So we've got an aggressive <laughs> rainbow Peppa Pig, and the title says, Gay Pigs Are Coming to Groom Your Kid. My thumbnail. That's a fucking great title and a good thumbnail. That's fucking hilarious. Thumbnail team deserves all of the prizes. Guggenheim Fellowships, National Endowment for the Arts. Some of the greatest art that is being produced in our world today is coming from the Michael Knowles Show thumbnail team. That's just a <laughs> fact. And the head- What, what have they got there? Juan Biden. The, oh, the fucking flute. I remember the, yeah, the crystal flute. That's just a fact. And the headlines, which I do not write, the headlines are pretty great too. Keep going. So because a kid show is trying to normalize the fact that same-sex couples exist, it's seen as grooming. Yeah, makes total sense. Yes, that, that is what grooming is. Uh, yes, that does make total sense. We lived in a society- So the funny thing is, like, and maybe he'll get into this, but these are the same people that don't think this is grooming that try to say raising children in a Christian household is grooming, right? So, but like, if they're anything, they're logically inconsistent. They're always logically inconsistent. Right, and that's the like that's the unfortunate reality when you try to argue with these people, debate with these people. They don't work in a logical worldview, right? At least not in like the uh, you know like they, they don't work it through like strings of logic. I don't even know how to phrase this properly, but for them, anything that is you know good for their goal is right. Anything that's bad for their goal is wrong. Um, so the undermining of Christian values by calling it grooming, raising children in a traditional religious household is fine. But to apply that same logic to something they are for, that obviously can't be grooming. Because I like this, therefore it's not grooming. It's, it's essentially the argument they make, right? They'll, they'll have like some kind of mental gymnastics for it, but like if you actually boil it down, it's that's basically what it is, right? If you separate yourself like one layer from it, and look at like what they're picking and choosing as like, you know, to get mad about a lot. Of it, a lot of it. There's no logical consistency. A lot of it just has to do with you know I'm for this or I'm against this. Society, for um, all of human history until 2015, in which marriage was rightly understood to be the union of a man and a woman, and specifically the perpetual union of one man and one woman for the sake of the generation and education of children. Then in 2015, the Supreme Court radically redefined that. And many Americans, myself included, do not accept that new definition. Not because we don't like gay people, not because we don't like lesbians, not because we don't like whatever. It's just because the word has meaning, the institution has meaning, and human nature is such that that, that necessarily is what marriage is. When well, and, and that's the thing, right? A lot of these are, <clears throat> when we're talking about marriage specifically, this is a religious concept, right? Um, now, it's not exclusive to Christianity. Obviously, Jews have something, uh, you know, they have marriage. Uh, Muslims have marriage. Uh, you know, religions all over the world have marriages. But the thing is, it is a religious concept, right? Th this idea of, like, one man and one woman, or even in, you know, other religions, there's polygamy, right? So that'll be, like, you know, one man and, like, five women. Um, but these are religious concepts, right? And the entire idea behind it is... Uh, and I've talked about this before. Basically, like religions are like evolve, evolved social structures, right? So even from like an atheistic point of view, like I, I would consider myself an atheist, even though I'm heavily Christian influenced. Obviously, being raised in a Christian family in a Christian country, yada yada yada. You know, if you look back one level, right? The reason these systems evolved, right? From from an evolutionary perspective, the reason these religions evolved and became so successful and came to dominate the world, um, especially Christianity being the most dominant religion, but 
even other religions that are, you know, regionally dominant, whether it be Islam in the Middle East or Hinduism in the Indian subcontinent or, you know, whatever religious system is from, like, a certain part of the world, the reason they became so dominant is because they allow for a certain percent, like, they allow for social cohesion, which stops those groups from fighting each other as much as they would fight other groups, and it allows, you know, them to kind of work together um, for, in, in kind of like a symbiotic relationship. So instead of having these two tribes going at each other, they have a shared religion, they're going to go after another tribe, right? It's... It's an evolutionary mechanism. It's an evolutionary adaptation. Um, and marriage is part of that is basically a system that has evolved for the better, for the, the children to end up in a better situation, right? And, and we, we know this now because, like, you know, now, now we have studies and stuff on the, you know, the decline of marriage and the decline of, uh, you know, two-parent households and stuff. And you see that it's like, you know, the, the number one indicator of whether you'll end up successful in life whether it be from a financial standpoint, from like not being addicted to drugs, not committing crime, right? There's, there's like a whole list of things is whether you were raised in a two-parent household or not, whether your parents were married. So obviously these things were beneficial and that's why they evolved. Uh, and then to try and like just completely redefine that and say, well, you know, it just it's just two people being together without this like desire for breeding, which is the entire evolutionary reason for it, right? It, it, it kind of just makes no sense from either an evolutionary perspective or from, like, obviously from a traditional religious perspective, it obviously makes no sense. But even from an evolutionary perspective, it makes no sense because the entire reason it, this is, like, an evolved mechanism is for producing and then supporting those offspring. When educational outlets, all the institutions that shape people's minds, go to the little kids and try to reshape and indoctrinate them, into a radical new way of thinking, especially when we're talking about sex, which is so fundamental to human nature, that is grooming. You are bringing them up to believe all sorts of things that are, in, that are disordered and to even perhaps indulge behaviors that are disordered. Now, whether you think those behaviors ought to be encouraged or not, that's actually beside the point. When you are slowly, and, th and that's the exact thing, right? Like I was saying earlier, they if they have no problem applying the same logic to any system they don't like, right? Whether it be Christianity or any other religion or um, anything they deem as like right wing, they have no problem applying this logic. But when you try to apply the same logic to them, now all of a sudden it's problematic. And not only that, but on certain social media sites, you could get banned for it. I think. Uh, Twitter is probably the most notable for this. They probably changed that now that Elon uh, runs the site. But there was a while there where you could get banned for talking about, you know, child grooming and its association with the LGBT movement on Twitter. Uh, but, like, they would, you know, if they, if they were logically consistent, then it would be there would be no problem with it. Rating, ...especially young people in this way, that is the very definition of grooming. So, yes, that does make sense. Now I want to hear what Mr. Knowles has to say about it. Why should there not be a lesbian couple with kids on the children's cartoon? Because it's disordered. <laughs> oh, Mr. Knowles. Have you had any thought that what you said has been eradicated by the American Psychiatric Association since 1973? <laughs> really? Have you had any thought of that? You can't just say something is disordered because of your homophobic bollocks. This guy's view is that the American Psychiatric Association is the authority on what sort of behaviors are ordered or disordered. I don't... You know what's funny is, so, it's essentially an appeal to authority fallacy, right? Whether it's true or not has no, you know, whether the American Psychiatric Association says it's true or not has no bearing on reality, right? It's just an appeal to authority fallacy. But the funniest part about this is the reason that, like, so many of these things have been, like, removed from disorders within a lot of these associations is because they infiltrated and overtook them from the inside, right? Because And the unfortunate reality is they realize how, how most humans think, right? The reality of the situation is most humans are not, like, hyper-logical, right? It's, it's very few people are like that. Most people are, you know, one, they don't have the time, and even if they do have the time, they don't have the desire to, like, get, like, you know, balls deep into the weeds and, like, you know, look through all the minutia and, like, look at the studies and all of this stuff. They, they just say, like, oh, yeah, I mean, these guys are, like, the guys, and they say it's not, therefore it's not, right? It's just an appeal to authority fallacy. 
don't have any idea why he would believe that, why a group of psychiatrists and a psychiatric lobby would have any particular expertise on morals and ethics and anthropology and human nature. Let's just even pretend that that premise were the case. I guess the next question would have to be, why did it take them until 1973? <laughs> what, what changed in human nature in 1973 that changed what, what constitutes an ordered or disordered romantic relationship? Nothing, all that changed is, is politics. You can't tell me that, the, <laughs> that human nature and bioethics and these moral questions were just completely eradicated, debunked, totally owned with facts and logic in 1973 because some stupid psychiatric lobby said so. That doesn't make any sense. Right now, head on over to Ring. One of the funniest things I find is like how the uh, the growth the growth with like these psychiatric institutions is now correlation doesn't equal causation, but the growth <coughs> with these psychiatric institutions is directly related to the amount of psychiatric problems. Right. So as these institutions have grown and become more powerful and become more prevalent, we have more psychiatric issues now than we ever have in modern history at least. So, they're not doing a very good job. Um, at the office on the other side of the world, Ring also has a leap for home this to... season with a Ring product that is right for you. It's a disorder. And two ladies cannot create a child together. And so the only way to do that is by reordering our adoption system or a, a creating all sorts of new bioethical concerns through surrogacy and, and in, in vitro fertilization and buying a man's sperm and renting a woman's womb and all the rest of it. And it's all disordered and it's wrong and it's un morally unacceptable. And that's why it shouldn't be there. Okay, first of all, when was that any of your business? Same-sex couples doing what they want to do to get a child. When was it any of my business? This is a good question. Uh, there are two answers to that. One, it's always been my business because I have faculties of reason. So even if something does not involve my direct participation, I can still come to conclusions about that thing. I can have something to say about the practice of female genital mutilation in Africa. It doesn't directly involve me, but I have faculties of reason and a moral conscience, and I can come to certain conclusions about what's true and false and right and wrong. I can express that opinion, and depending on my involvement in the polities in Africa, I can actually have some say about that. And this is what brings me to the second point. It is my business because I am a citizen and we are supposed to have self-government in this country. Because marriage is the fundamental political institution, I definitely have a say in marriage. I definitely ought to have a say in what marriage is. What business is it of, of Anthony Kennedy's when he redefines marriage from the bench? He unjustly and illegitimately took a power that was not properly his to, to wield. At the very least, if he could do it, we can do it too. Keep going. Uh, so I think more importantly is like how it works out for the children, right? That should be the most important thing. Um, you know, throw, throw religion aside, throw, you know, moral questions, whatever aside, what are the results of this on children, right? And the fact that, you know, as, as a society, we need to worry about the next generation and make sure they are best set up, both for personal reasons, right? Like, uh, you know, selfish reasons in the sense that, like, we want ourselves and our children to have a better life, but also in a less personal, selfish way, you want the entire system to function. I guess you could argue, like, it, it, even that is kind of selfish, right? Like, the idea that, like, you know, you want the system to function because it kind of is, like, your legacy, I guess you could say, the legacy of your people. Um, but, yeah, it, it, a lot of it is just the desire for the system to function, both for your offspring and for yourself. Um, and trying to find the way that it functions best is obviously, you know, we, we make these decisions all the time, right? It... it Almost no one, even people who self-identify as libertarian, almost no one is actually like a true, like hardcore, like autistic turbo libertarian, right? Everyone has something that they, they can't stand for, right? And, and there, there's a reason for that, just because they don't think it's beneficial for society. Second of all, you mentioned that this is promoting bioethical concerns. What the hell? See, what I don't understand is why do you guys complain about this stuff when gay people are being shown? But when it's a heterosexual couple, y'all are completely silent about it. There are uh, several... Because they could have kids, and it's been shown to be the best way to raise children, right? I, I get, like... 
I don't even know what to say other than that. Like, it, it's pretty obvious what the difference is. Like, you don't even have to be religious to see that. Questions in there that he just raised. Why would we complain about a lesbian couple on Peppa Pig, but not a married regular couple on Peppa Pig? Because those things are different. The lesbian married couple having a child somehow through some bioethically extremely suspect means, such as surrogacy, in vitro fertilization, lesbian adoption, whatever, because that is disordered. That's wrong. Mommy and daddy having a baby the old fashioned way and raising them in a good, stable family, that is good. So one of those things is bad, one of those things is good, one of those things should be discouraged, one of those things should be encouraged. Those are different things. So that's why we have different reactions to the two of them. Men and women are for one another. We want to encourage the ordered and good use of our sex and our bodies and not the disordered use of it. Again, you might say, Michael, I think that's all bunk. I don't care. I think people should be able to do whatever they want to do. Okay, I suppose you're entitled to your opinion. Okay, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying, how dare you call this disordered vis-a-vis -vis this other action? And I'm saying because if order and disorder are to have any meaning at all, that would have to be an example of it. Yeah, as long as... And like I said at the beginning of this, right? <clears throat> the These same people will call straight Christian couples groomers for raising a child in a Christian household, right? A lot of it has nothing to do with the results, right? Because we, we, we know the results. We know that, like, the, the best way to raise a child is in a uh, straight household with traditional values, and that's probably how the child's going to end up most successful, right? Two-parent, traditional household, best chance of success for the child. They don't care about that, right? To them, it is all about the end goal, right? The the ends justify the means. And you see this in everything they do, right? The argument is not... It, it, there, there's no logical premise in the argument other than what their end goal is, and this helps achieve, achieve that end goal. Um, they, they will have a, a massive amount of logical inconsistency because instead of, like, starting with a premise and then working forward from that and, like, seeing where... You know, where does this premise lead? They start with a end goal, and then they work backward from that to figure out where do they need to start. If it's consensual, then it shouldn't be a concern. Well, why are you forcing your opinion on me, man? You're telling me that as long as behaviors are consensual, then no one should have any say about it. What this guy is failing to see is that opinion is a moral view that you are imposing on me. Because my view is that consent is not the only criterion when we're, we're talking about moral actions. We actually ought to be able to express our opinions on things and to be able to shape the laws that we want in self-governments and to be able to shape the standards and norms we want in society. And you're telling me that my opinion is coercive, but your opinion is just as coercive when you're telling me I need to shut up and when you're imposing your moral view that consent is all that matters. The question is not who's being coercive, who's forcing their views down other people's throats. The question is what's the correct view, what's right? And I think the view that the only thing that matters in the entire world is consent is just obviously not true. So I actually, I actually disagree with Michael here. I think the problem is thinking that there is a correct moral system. The problem is, you know, obviously a Christian's going to think that he's, I, I believe, Catholic. Um, and then obviously also this gay dude is going to think the same thing, right? Because uh, whatever allows him to have his most amount of freedom is therefore the correct moral system. But the reality of the situation is morals are largely... Um, I don't even know what you say. Like they're, they're, the, when it comes to a moral system, there's a large, a large amount of subjectivity, right? The correct moral system really depends on what your end goals are. Now, if your end goals are to have the most, like the most well-functioning society, um, and uh, and then again, we have to define most well-functioning, right? So, like, you know, from a rationalistic point of view, maybe it's a society that has a high birth rate because then you have, you know, GDP growth and societal growth. Um, large amounts of technological development, um, you know, whatever things you think are beneficial for society, your moral system is going to reflect that, right? So the, the problem is, and I think this is a problem that, like, a lot of hardcore atheists get into, uh, you know, probably most notably Sam Harris, you know, is that moral systems are largely subjective. Even the idea that, like, you know, S Sam often talks about, like, harm reduction with his philosophy uh, and, base and ironically, basically just shoehorns, like, Judeo-Christian ethics into a kind of atheistic framework because they're obviously the most logical despite the fact that the only reason he thinks that, even though he won't acknowledge that, is because he was, you know, 
he's a Jewish man who went to a Jewish private school in a mostly Christian country. Um, you know, and, and so, so like obviously his ethics are going to be heavily informed by Judeo-Christian values. But the reality of the situation is if you were going to have like a 100% like atheist agnostic worldview, you could basically decide anything was a functional moral system, right? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not pro-Nazi, obviously. Uh, but like from a 100% rationalistic perspective, there was nothing wrong with the, the Nazi vision of the world, right? If you're, if you're just going to be 100% logical, well, okay, so from, like, an evolutionary perspective, they want to spread their genes, right, the Germans or the Aryans, right, basically, like, the, the you know, the Germanic-speaking peoples, right, so the English, the Dutch, the Germans, all of that, they thought they were the superior race, and they need to expand their people, and in order to do that, they have to take out other people and conquer their land. That is a 100% rational argument to make. Now, obviously, people who live in, you know, Christian countries have moral quandrums with that, but it, you can't argue that it's not rational. I mean, maybe you could in the fact that like they didn't actually have the military power to do it, so it was kind of a suicide mission. Um, but you know, if assume they did have the the military power, what makes that more ethical than anything else? Right? The only thing that makes it more ethical than anything else is the fact that because of our, you know, our Christian underpinnings of our society, we think these things are bad. But from a 100% logical standpoint, it makes sense, right? This isn't what God wanted. Karen, sit down. This exists because some people, even straight people, cannot get pregnant. That's why we have this stuff. Take a pause. So, so now he's saying, well, how come you're only talking about in vitro fertilization as a bad thing with gay couples, but not with straight couples? No, I'm saying it's bad in general. I'm saying surrogacy, renting women's wombs, creating babies in test tubes, implanting them, very often aborting them. The ones that you don't implant or abort, you just put in a freezer. All of that, I think, is morally unacceptable. It's certainly morally very dubious. I happen to think it's, it's totally unacceptable. I think, again, by definition, human life begins at conception. And so when you create a lot of these embryos, a lot of these little tiny babies, and you put them in a freezer forever, that's a big problem. I think when you separate the procreative and uh, conjugal acts of sex, you're in for a whole world of trouble. I think that a child has the right to his natural mother and father and the right to be conceived in the conjugal act of his parents, who are joined together in marriage, by the way. And so I, I think the only people that can be said to have any rights when it comes to procreation are the children, not... So actually, I disagree with this a lot, right? Um, if people can't have kids and they want to have kids, let, let them have kids, right? Like, even if they need some help. Now, there's obviously some moral questions that come in when it's like, is the genetic reason you can't have children? Which, uh, to be fair, that'll even be fixed soon with like stuff like CRISPR and stuff. But, you know, until we get to that point, are you basically, you know, because at that point you're kind of getting like kind of selfish, right? Like you're going to bring another child into the world that is going to have the same issues that you had, right? Where they can't have children. Um, although, again, with CRISPR and stuff, that's not really that big of an issue anymore and it won't be even more so in 20 years. But I think, yeah, like, this idea that, like, because that baby wasn't made during sex, therefore it's a sin, I think that's kind of ridiculous. Right, if people, if people want to have kids and they're, you know, they, they're having issues with that, but they're otherwise, like, a normal, functioning, healthy couple, let them have kids. Like, who gives a shit? Not the parents, not the lesbian pigs, not anybody else. They don't have rights. They might very sincerely desire to create kids in this way. Sorry that you have that desire, that you refuse... Yeah, I think that's kind of ridiculous, right? Just that idea in general. Um, yeah, that, that I'm not really on board with. Like, this this idea that, like, just because, you know, you have some... And again, I think it, it really does depend, right? Like, you know, why aren't you able to have offspring? Um, if it's something that's going to be passed on to the children, maybe you should have some questions about that. Um, but I think the big problem nowadays is, you know, a lot of girls, by the time they're 14, 15, 16 years old, right? I think the average age to start becoming sexually active nowadays is something like 15 or 16. A lot of these girls are on birth control from the time they're 14, 15, 16 years old. They hit 30, they decide they want to have kids. But the problem is, you know, when you've been half your life on low doses of drugs that we used to use to chemically castrate people, your fertility is like through the fucking floor, right? A lot of these girls, by the time they're 30, 35, because they've been on birth control their entire lives, are now basically sterilized, right? They're, they're completely infertile. Um, they have to take 
certain there's like certain drugs they can try to like reboot their system with. A lot of that doesn't really work very well, and they have all these other issues. And then on the, on the male end, uh, like microplastics in the water, low testosterone from incredibly sedentary lifestyles, a lot of issues lead to like low sperm counts. Um, you know, the average male sperm count, I think is. I think it's one third of what it is in the '70s, and the sperm count from the '70s to the '50s is one half of what it is. So if you're looking at like, you know, going back to the '50s, the average man has like a one sixth the sperm count of like his grandfather or great grandfather or whatever it would be back then. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of issues, but I think a lot of it just depends on uh, you know the situation. But like, if you're an otherwise healthy individual who made some you know bad decisions in your past, whether it come to like birth control or you know not having a healthy lifestyle. Um, yeah, you should you should be able to have kids. Well, in the way that it can be fulfilled in a moral way, but that's that's not my problem, and it's certainly not the kids' problem. If you don't like it, well, that's a you problem. No, that's a you problem, <laughs> too, because you're saying, well, Michael, if you don't like that view, you just have to shut up. No, I don't. No, I don't. I actually, for, as of now, I can articulate my views. I still have reason. I still have a moral conscience, and for now, at least, we still have some political power in this country, and we are going to, with grace and with courage, with the grace from God to be able to do so, and if, if we can muster any courage, we will craft the laws that we want to live under within the boundaries of the Constitution. And if you... Oh, over the next hundred years or so, the Christian conservatives will probably gain more power. They're going through a little bit of a lull right now, but the reality is if you look at the birth rates, right, there's a reason they're so worried about like, running the education institutes, right, because they don't have their own kids, they have yours, right? Whether you're talking about like you know, the LGBT movement, which tends to have a lot less kids, trans movement, which means you're pretty much unable to have kids, uh, all these different antinatalist movements, whether it comes to, like, the feminist side of antinatalism, where it's like, you know, these girls, they're, like, 30, 35, 40, 45 years old, and then they realize they can't have kids, um, and they've been lied to by feminism, or you're talking about, uh, you know, the, the environmental antinatalist movement, where, like, they don't want to have kids because they don't want to, you know, hurt the environment. Right, the the birth rate is <clears throat> like 1.72, I think, is what it is in the United States. But if you actually break that down by political faction, conservatives are well above replacement rate. It's just liberals are like well below replacement rate. When you average them out together, it ends up being about 1.72. Right, if you and it, like, you can see this if you like like Hasidic Jews, um, you know, the Amish, the Mormons, uh, Christian like Catholic conservatives. All these different groups have like a, birth rates that are like incredibly high. Right. So over time, eventually, you know, I, I saw this one meme the other day and it said that, uh, you know, believing in evolution is ironically a uh, evolutionary disadvantage because who has more kids, right? People who, you know, don't believe in evolution or people who do believe in evolution. And it's mostly people who don't believe in evolution, right? So uh, I, I, ironically, being an atheist is one of the best things you can do to win yourself a Darwin Award. You don't like that. That's too bad. Okay. That's a you problem. Progressives, the snowflakes, they get offended by everything. And then y'all get offended when a kid's show shows the same-sex couple. Like... No, it's not, it's not that we're offended so much as we say it's wrong and we criticize it and we say it shouldn't happen and there shouldn't be any more of it. To be fair, I do find lots of things offensive and I do think we should discourage some offensive things. I think that's fair. I don't, I'm not a free speech absolutist. I don't think that's anything resembling a conservative position. In many ways, I wish people could be much more offended. I think we live in a shameless culture where people go around, there's pornography everywhere. People are vicious and insulting to everyone. We don't have any sense of what's right and wrong. We're, we're actually, we've become very callous to all of these things. I think we should become much more offended. People don't hold the doors anymore for women. They don't stand up when women enter a room. We should cultivate a sense of being offended by our coarse and shameless culture, because then we can live in a good culture again. Something's gone very, very wrong. We've lost something that, that once gave us a flourishing good culture. We've got to get that back, okay? And we're not gonna get it back with lesbian pigs on the TV. I hope you enjoyed that thorough d Yeah, so I think, you know, the, uh, the good and the bad news is, I think the bad news is, the right is on is almost certainly going to lose short term. You know, if we're talking like the next 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, the right's going to continue to make losses. But with the birth rates, 20, 40, 60, 100 years out, we should be able to make some big gains. We just need to start playing long term. So, like, if you look at what the left did, right, they... they they started this in like the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and like by, by the time you get to the 60s and 70s, they had support from the Soviet Union. Um, but, but a lot of it started as like a grassroots thing that was kind of like co-opted by the Soviet Union. 
they went into the institutions and they took them over from the inside out. We need to largely do the same thing. I think one of the big problems is because of the nature of conservatism, conservatives tend to not want to be in positions of government power because they don't think the government should have that much power. Right. And you see the issue with this, whether it be like CBC in Canada or BBC in the UK, right? These are two national news organizations that are actually run by the government, but they're extremely left wing. Why is that? It's because conservatives don't apply for those jobs because they don't think that the, those things should exist, right? That there are more libertarian economic systems, um, which is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a grand idea in theory, but the problem is if one side's willing to use government power to force shit down your throat and the other side's not willing to use government power, which side's going to win over any extended period of time, right? The only thing saving us is the birth rates, Right. And that can only save us if we pull our kids out of these education institutes until we're able to get them back, uh, take them back over. Because, again, they don't have they don't have their own kids. They have your kids. So, anyway, uh, great video. Um, let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.